What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Sheehan Show on Sherdog.com. And BetUS is offering our listeners incredible 125% bonus on their deposits for the upcoming UFC 273. Use that code Sherdog and get up to $2,500 in extra money to make fight night even better at BetUS.com. You can not only bet on each fight, but they have loads of awesome parallel bets to choose from too. Bet live during the fights and your winnings are paid within hours. So start the fight at betus.com and use that code SHERDOG, S-H-E-R-D-O-G. Right everyone, today I'm going to talk about Cage Warriors. And it was a massive weekend in the world of UK and Irish MMA and even, even beyond uh, with two fantastic Cage Warriors uh, fight nights. And when I say fantastic fight nights... I mean, fantastic fight night. There was hardly a decision on either card. There wasn't any decision on Cage Warriors 136, which went down on Saturday night. And some really, really good prospects emerged. A new champion was crowned in the middleweight division, uh, which I will talk about here in a second. And uh, all in all, it was another, look, it was another fantastic couple of nights from Cage Warriors. Um... There was a bit of talk this week, obviously, you know, I know Ariel talked about it on his show, uh, and he kind of called out Graham Boylan, uh, who is obviously running Cage Warriors uh, at the moment, and who is also a manager to lots of fighters, Paddy Pimblett being one, and obviously they started with Paddy Pimblett getting paid 12 and 12. And, you know, that is something that has happened throughout uh, all the time in MMA, you know, Dana White was a manager back in the day, and you know, we've seen the Ali Abdelaziz stuff, and he had to step away from uh, the World Series of Fighting as it was at at the time, and you know, Graham Boylan, obviously, at uh, Cagers at the moment, he had the likes of Paddy Pimblett, and even, I think he managed McGregor even back in the day, and you know, if some fighters move on, some fighters say, there's a conflict there, there's definitely an issue there, I think Ariel was right to, to, to call it out. Uh, the big issue, obviously, with it being uh in the uk is we don't have the rules in the uk or ireland like there is in america so it's not illegal graham boylan's not doing anything wrong or anything like that no that's that's a fine discussion and a discussion we can have here but maybe it's a discussion for another day uh in terms of what i want to say here what i want to say here just quickly before i get into the fights because maybe people are thinking about this fight like are they legit is it right you know are, are these lads getting easy matchups and stuff like that and you can have your whatever your opinion is my opinion and it is this, and I have to say this opinion before I get into these fights, or otherwise, you know, maybe, as I said, people will be thinking about it. Ian Dean is matchmaking these fights, and if anyone knows about Ian Dean, there's a short article written about him recently uh, over in a uh, paper in the UK, or one of the, the websites in the UK, I think, uh, you know, talking about how great of a man he is, how he he builds these guys to get to where they need to get to at the right time. And I fully agree with that, and I fully believe that, and it's something I've said for years. And if you're looking at a Cage Warriors card... And you're thinking, oh, is this just uh, all of Graham Boylan's clients getting easy matchups or what? Like people have said about uh, World Series of Fighting down through the years. I, in my opinion, and you can take my opinion for what it's worth, I don't, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's very fair fights for everyone who's fighting. You know, some people obviously need to be built up from the, the bottom when they get to the top. You know, if you're at Cage Warrior Championship level or below or whatever, you're getting matched at the right level the whole way up. You know, I'm not saying, you know, I want to know guys getting thrown in against some monster in his first fight, but you know what I mean? It's right, correct matchmaking at the right time to bring the guys to where they need to get there so the best can fight the best when they are the best. And I fully believe that, and I have a lot of respect for Ian Dean and what Cage Warriors do, so you can, I think there's definitely points to be made about uh, managing and promoting people at the same time, but the matchmaking, the questions people have over the matchmaking, my opinion... I, I don't I don't agree with a part with anyone. I wouldn't agree with anyone if they said that Ian Dean's matchmaking, if the matchmaking in Cage Warriors isn't very good. Like look at Paddy Pimblett. Paddy Pimblett lost a few fights in Cage Warriors. No, Paddy Pimblett probably spent a few years extra in Cage Warriors than anyone would have wanted him there because they matched him. He, okay, he didn't lose the Julian Orosa fight, but he lost to Sarton Back, who's a very good fighter. He lost to Nad Naramani, who went on into the UFC and you know has done pretty well. He's lost a couple of fights and he's won a couple of fights and stuff like that. So um, that's my take on that. I, you know, if people wanted to to hear it, maybe they thought it'd be weird if I went in just talking about Cage Warriors without mentioning that. Considering it was a big talking point this week. I uh, that that's where I stand on these fights, and to be honest, look, there was a few <laughs> there was a few fights they ended so quickly on this. You'll be like, oh, what's what's going on? But it was just because there was some phenomenal performance. There was some really good fights, some really good back and forth, and uh, it was a, a fantastic couple of nights in Cage Warriors. You know, obviously for me here in Ireland, 
sometimes it's tough to watch GOC and Bellator and World Series of Fight or PFL, sorry, and all of those because they're on very late, you know, as I sit here at 1 a.m. recording this. <laughs> you get me? Like, I'm up till 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning watching these fights. Maybe if I have to do a podcast afterwards, just talking about it, and it's. You know, even if it's a brilliant card, you know, we've, we've Aljo versus the, um, Jan and the Korean Zombie and Ian Gary and Volkanovsky and all this weekend. But not, Ian Gary's not fighting Volkanovsky, you know what I mean? Um, but still, you're tired and you're wrecked. This is on, it was on at six o'clock. You know, I was <laughs> able to go and watch it the next, you know, I haven't been to dinner before. And, you know, even if you get a takeaway during the card, which is not possible here during the UFC and stuff like that, it's fun, it's great, it's more enjoyable. And maybe I'm a little bit biased towards him and Bellator when they're on early or whatever cards are on early. You know, UFC London was great the last day as well. Just because it's a little bit easier and it's a little bit more fun. And, these, it really was fun for the last uh, the the Friday and the Saturday night cards were, were really good. I'm going to start um, with the uh, with the Saturday night card first. I'm going to go in in reverse a little because that is the card that had no uh, no decision. So the judges had a very easy night there. They got paid for doing nothing basically. I think they had only a few rounds to to judge as well. Um, some of the standout things on uh, the undercard, uh, Michael uh, Chimu, he's a guy who uh, they call him Big Mike. He's a guy who um, uh, he's fighting out of Newcastle in England and a friend of mine Jake Smith who's a very good journalist covering the sport in that part of the world rates this guy very highly he thinks he's very very good and there are a lot of people do as well he's been, you know, he's had a f- few tough fights I think he's 2-1 now in his career but he's definitely a guy to keep an eye on he got the first round KO finish here uh, in his fight Dylan Hazan another guy to definitely keep an eye on uh, I think he moves to around 8-0 in his career now if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the record up in front of me just as we speak. Um, he got a, a, a TKO of our retirement after the first round here as well, but he's a very, very good fighter. And uh, we will uh, you, you'll see a lot coming from him over the next while. But then we had, in, in a row, three of the, the best KOs in a row that you'll ever see. You really, you really, really will. First, I, I'm going to go backwards with these as well. I'm going backwards with everything. Uh, Alexei Mantikivi versus Janderson Castro. This was a very, very good fight. Castro came in. If anyone was listening to the betting show, he's training out of Ireland. Uh, and he was a big, big underdog coming in uh, to this fight. But he didn't look that way in the first round. He came out there and he struck with Mantikivi. He landed some very, very good shots. Good back and forth fight. Uh, but in the second round, Mantikivi hit him with a big shot. They said in the commentary that it broke a tooth and the tooth went flying out. And it felt like... He kind of got shocked by that. He hit. He was hit with another shot, and it really hurt him. And you could see he was just standing there, and he kind of turned his back. And that last knockout blow just absolutely face planted him. Really good KO for Mantikivi, but you'd you'd feel a bit sorry for uh, Jan uh, uh, Janderson Castro because it was such a tough knockout. But I thought it was a wonderful performance for him. You know, I thought it was a really really good performance for him. It unfortunately, it ended the way he did for him. But for Mantikivi, you know, he's a guy that's been around for a long time. And after he lost to Reese McKee, like, he probably got a little bit of disrespect after that. People saying, oh, Reese McKee's getting an easy matchup coming from the UFC back and stuff. That wasn't an easy matchup at the time. And, um, it's, uh, it's definitely not, um, uh, it definitely doesn't show what type of fighter Mantikivi is because he's a, a very, very good fighter. And, uh, you know, definitely someone in that division in, in Cage Warriors who you, uh, you know, who you need to, uh, who you need to keep an eye on uh, and see where he goes in over the next, uh, over the next while. You know, he hasn't fought that much in, in the last while. I said that, that Reese McKee fight was in, uh, last October, I think it was, but it was two years almost to the day th- that he fought before that. So good to see him back here to winning ways as well with, uh, hopefully the pandemic, uh, getting, uh, getting behind us now. Um, Liam Alliden, a beautiful left hook KO over Ben Reese. Uh, just a magnificent shot. Just slept him. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's up on my Twitter, but. The KO for me on this undercard, and Mick Stanton obviously got a very good uh, finish as well in, in his fight with Ground Upon. But the KO for me, Maniac Pan, if you haven't seen it, this one is a this is a knockout of the year contender. This is a this is a knockout of all time contender for me. And now I'm a bit biased because I really like Maniac Pan. I think he's a fantastic fighter. You know, you see the lads up behind me, the Wonder Boys, the Anderson Silvas, the MVPs, especially. This was like a, a capoeira wheel kick, hand on the ground. Con him, you know, th- so, um, Conor Hitchens was a very good fighter and was winning the fight well. This, uh, th- this was a uh, knockout at the last 30 seconds of the second round. And Hitchens was winning both rounds up until that point. He had his hand up to kind of block the shot, kind of seeing it was as it was coming. But usually, you know, shots come in like this way, but he was kind of turned that way. And the shot came in like, 
behind his arm and hit him like right on the back of the head, back of the ear, kind of right in the back of the head, back of the ear, and just face banded him and went down. Connor Hitchens a tough guy that survived it it took a couple of ground and pound shots to put him out he was trying to get back up and look the referee absolutely made the, the right decision and stopped the fight but this was an unreal KO Manny Akpan he look he got taken down a few times throughout the fight he needs to improve that takedown defense he needs to get better in that area but if he does there aren't many guys in the world who can strike uh, at this level the way he does absolutely phenomenal and I, I hope, I hope, I hope he gets better in the takedown defense realm. I hope he puts that side of his game together because if he does, he could go anywhere. And it'd be a shame if he didn't, you know. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where he goes uh, over over the next while. One point I want to make here as well before I move to, to the main car. I said the, the, the referee was, uh, was a good and it was a good stoppage there. The referee throughout the two nights wasn't great. Now, you'd Mark Goddard there, but you had a couple of lads um, coming up from the uh, the local scene in uh, in the UK and do you know what I think maybe they need a little bit more time in the local scene and now I don't want I don't like slating referees or judges or anything like that but there was a lot of very iffy calls a lot of bad stand-ups a lot of uh, there was w- uh, one fight it was the Aaron AB fight I believe against Gerardo Fanny which I'll get to in a second where AB landed seven knees and the referee said work I was like, he just landed seven knees. It was uh, so he was on the ground in um, kind of the side control from the back, if you want to get it that way, kind of in the right position. No, side control, but uh, the opponent on the back, a uh, genuine side control. And he landed knee, 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 knee into the side. And he was telling him to work. I'm like, okay, they weren't the biggest knees in the world, but this is like, he is working. This is the definition of working. This is exactly what you should be in this position. Do, uh, this is exactly what you should be doing in this position. And you're telling him to work. You're telling him to change a game plan from there. That, to me, is exactly what a referee shouldn't be doing, and I didn't really like that at all. And we saw that a few times throughout uh, throughout the weekend. So that would be the, the only real negative I, I would have on that. So, um, yeah, I, I said I'd mention that. Uh, one of the biggest positives I had on the weekend was Luke Riley versus Jack Elgin. Um, these two lads, I think, coming into it, did only four or five fights between them in their career, and you won't see a higher level of fight as this anywhere in the world between guys with that experience level. Absolutely phenomenal. Jack Elgin, you know, I gave Luke Riley as, as one of my bets this week, and I knew, like, it was hard to find a lot of Jack Elgin, I won't lie, and I, I think I said that on uh, on the betting show as well. Hard to find clips of him, but by, by God, we know what he's like now. Slick striker, hitting hard. You know, uh, Luke Riley's a very good striker as well. They were giving out to me in the comment section on, on YouTube. I was saying he might go for a few takedowns and stuff. And, you know, fair fair play. Yeah, he, is, <laughs> he definitely showed uh, he's not going to shoot for a takedown anyway uh, after this fight because he struck and struck and struck with Jack Elgin, even though he was getting hit hard. But... He took those shots and he kept going. You know, Paddy, uh, Paddy Pimblett, uh, his, uh, Luke Riley's teammates says, Scousers don't get knocked out. And God, by this, the look of this fight, they certainly don't because he kept going and he turned the tide and he ended up getting the finish himself. And he got a lovely finish, uh, in the end as well. So really tough matchup for Luke Riley at this stage of his career, but he'll be going on. Uh, uh, like this is one of those fights where I wouldn't say that Luke Riley has a higher ceiling than Jack Elgin after this fight, even though he beat him and he got the finish. Like, Luke Riley's cardio, I think, was a mile and a step above Jack Elgin's and a step above probably a lot of people in that, uh, in in any division, in, in the whole of Cage Warriors. It looked unbelievable. The amount of shots he threw and the amount of shots he took and to still be gone strong, what, nine and a half minutes into the fight was, was a lot. And Jack Elgin, I think, just didn't have that. But also... Luke Riley landed our shots and it was great stuff so I would definitely keep an eye on both of them lads going forward uh, Reese McEwen then defeated Sam Spencer uh, he got the submission very late in that fight McEwen dominated the first round took down uh, Sam Spencer Sam Spencer won the second round then um, and in the third McEwen took him down again great commentary by this by Daniel Strauss uh, if you haven't uh, watched this I would, I would urge anyone to go back and watch the last minute of this he talked through exactly what <laughs> Reese McEwen was going to do seconds before he actually did it uh, and you know basically talked through how he was going to get a late finish by a submission in a fight that he was probably winning at that stage and it was uh, it was exceptional commentary and an exceptional rear naked choke as well uh, there was another early KO Adam Cullen you know, that's one, I can't talk you through too much, but he threw a shot and he knocked him out very, very early. Went forward, landed that big left inside again. There was a lot of left hands and left hooks in this fight. Uh, ended in a very, very good stoppage win for uh, Adam Cullen then. Aaron Aby, if, if you don't know this guy, he went in there and he beat Gerardo Fanny as well. Late in the third, halfway through the third round, sorry. 
by a rear naked choke. Um, you know, Fetty came into the promotion. He fought Jack Cartwright for the championship. Lost that one. Uh, pretty pretty easily, but Jack Carter is a very very good fighter. I think we'd probably see him uh, in the UFC very soon, or then White Contender Series, or somewhere like that. And he bounced back with two big wins. You know, I had him as one of my biggest favorites, as one of my bets coming into this. But Aaron Aby, a guy who has suffered with cancer and and I think it was it cystic fibrosis as well. Yeah, God, oh my, this guy, what a story! I think my my uh, my colleague Harry Williams over in Severe May was talking about this should be a Hollywood movie, and honestly, <laughs> it really really should. This guy is is. He's brilliant, you know, and, um, you know, he's an inspiration. He should be an inspiration for everyone uh, everywhere. And to win this fight, to win this fight against Gerard Fanny, Gerard Fanny's a very, very good fighter, and he dominated him from pillar to post, basically. Won this fight at a canter. This wasn't a lucky submission against a guy who's not that good. This was a good win, a dominating win over a long period against someone who's very, very good. Fantastic stuff from Aaron Aby. Couldn't be more impressed. Really, really good win. Standout win here on uh, the weekend for Cage Warriors. Um... And in the main event, D, look, the standout uh, win on the uh, on the weekend has to be Christian Leroy Duncan, who defeated Jatty Milan by a flying knee uh, after 48 seconds of the third round to win the Cage Warriors middleweight belt. Um, look, the first round, Milan came in and he took him down. I think everyone kind of thought he would do that. Daniel Strauss said it on the commentary. I said it on the preview as well. I thought that w- would be something that would go on for a little bit longer. But at the start of the second round... Christian Leroy Duncan did something very, very intelligent. He went out and he tried to take Milan down. And he didn't manage to do it or he just pushed him against the cage a little bit. But it pushed Milan back. And the next the next exchange, it allowed Christian Leroy Duncan to land shots. And suddenly he was the one putting Milan on the back foot. He was the one threatening rather than Milan uh, getting those takedowns. And rather than Milan winning the, the, the uh, maybe not necessarily the fight, but the running of the fight. And it was very, very smart. And it was uh, a really good game plan. You know, with Mark Kerr in his corner, I believe, as well. So absolutely fantastic stuff from Christian Neri Duncan. Milan looked very, very tired towards the latter half of that round. Um, and then there was a very weird incident where Chatty Milan's uh, contact lens fell out in the middle of the round. And Mark Goddard was like, you're not supposed to have contact lenses. You can't have that. And then he tried to replace it after the first round. And then it fell out in the middle of the second round. Then after the second round, he just spent his whole try- time trying to put in uh, the contact lens. Then Mark Goddard basically had to throw out his corner. He had blood all over his face. They never wiped it off. He was in just complete disarray. And 48 seconds into the next round, he looked really tired. He looked in complete disarray. Christian Leroy Duncan first threw like an axe kick, just bar- barely missed it. Look, do you like my, do you like my axe kick <laughs> over there? Just barely missed it. And then landed a flying knee. And it was a flying knee where he went up with the flying knee and then inwards and hit him. It wasn't just a direct flying knee because it looked like it was going to the um, uh, shoulder and he went in with it and hit him right in the chin. Beautiful flying knee. An absolutely fantastic win there. And this guy's going to be in the UFC. He's only, what, six, seven fights into his career now at this stage. But... The middleweight division is not the strongest division in the world, but this guy is a strong contender, and he's going to go all the way. I think, like you know, uh, not not to uh, not to blow him up too much, but I think this guy is going to go all the way to the to the very very top, and I'm looking forward to see it. So that was all of Cage Warriors uh, one three six there. Um, before I move on to Cage Warriors one three five, uh, I have to tell you about uh, BetUS.com as well, and UFC two seven three. As I said, it's going to be more fun this week when you bet at BetUS.com. Use that code SHERDOG to get an incredible hundred and twenty five percent bonus up. Up to $2,500. Volkanovski is a clear favourite against Korean Zombie. So get in now or even choose to bet on him to win via TKO to increase your winnings at BetUS.com. You can make the fights even more fun by betting throughout the fights. Start the fight at BetUS.com and use that code SHERDOG. S-H-E-R-D-O-G. Right. Cage Warriors 135. Another fantastic card. Um... Let me talk about the main event first, because I want to maybe maybe end it talking about some of the Irish guys. Uh, Justin Burlinson versus Daniel Skibinski. Um, Skibinski came out here and he did exactly, I think, what I thought and a lot of people were doing. He put the pressure on Justin Burlinson. He landed some big shots. He was dominating the fight. He hurt Burlinson a few times. And, you know, it looked like he could have been out of there in that first round, Burlinson. But he stuck to it. He kept to his game plan. He was he was worldly wise, I think, in this fight, uh, Justin Burlinson, and he came through a lot. He um he landed some good shots of his sell- his own, but he was also able to take a few very very good shots, and he ended up getting the finish. He got the guillotine choke towards the end of round two, and you know, um, 
after coming off of Dana White Contender Series with a lot of pressure on him going into that and a lot of expectation as well. Having lost that fight, that pressure, okay, the expectation might not be there as much anymore, but the pressure probably expands, especially when you're up against someone so good. Like, we talk about the, the matchmaking in this and talk about Ian Dean. And I think um, I think it was on the commentary they said it that Burlington is so well respected and so uh, so hyped maybe that they had to give him someone as good as Skibinski, even though I think Burlington's only six and one in his career, only a few fights in his career, and Skibinski is a lot more than that, and has fought very very high level competition in Eastern Europe and beyond, um, and that brings an added, an added pressure in a fight that where you already would have a lot of pressure. To, to be put in there with that sort of opponent for the start of the fight to go very badly and then to still win that fight, that says a lot about Justin Borlinson. You know, you can have a fight like that and it will say you're a good fighter and it will say you're able to come through things, but to have a fight like that at this portion of his career against that sort of opponent under that pressure, I think that says even more about a person. I'm very, very impressed with Justin Borlinson. Fantastic uh, win there. And, you know... I'm sure he won't be too happy with his performance in, in maybe the first round, but I think he'll look back on that fight as a, as a massive fight uh, in his career and one that uh, will be very, very important as uh, as the time goes on in his career. Um, uh, elsewhere on the rest of that card, uh, the former champion Matt Bonner came in on short notice, uh, as did Hugo Pereira, and both of them looked very tired after the first round, uh, but Matt Bonner ended up getting the finish, the rear naked choke, uh, less than a minute into the second round. Um, Milan Addy beat um, Antonio Sheldon there was three decisions in a row Dean Truman ended up losing to Ruggieri Liam Gittins beat uh, Ed Walls there as well um, on the undercard Andrew Sanchez got a lovely KO against Connor Wilson beautiful left hook to open up the card um, um, uh, there was a no contest in the Hugo Gillen Matt Byfield card um, Paul McBain ended up losing to Federico Pasquale Emil Brown as well got a love, another very good finish he's a guy you definitely need to be keeping an eye on to a very 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 good fighter um, so let me talk about the, the four Irish guys and you know Graham Boylan tweeted it out the other day that there's an Irish invasion coming back to Cage Warriors again and you know the interim champion at 145 at the moment is Paul Hughes we obviously saw Ian Gary coming out of Cage Warriors um you know, we've seen um, John Mitchell and Palahan around the the world. They've had fights in cage wires. When we see the guys coming uh, now as well, you know, back in the day, obviously we had McGregor, we had uh, uh, Paul Reds uh, Redmond, and we had you know Carl Bindred and, and all of those lads as well. And we have Reese McKee, you know. And there's probably there's probably like three or four lads. I'm I'm forgetting now, so apologies. But everyone knows like the, the usual suspects uh, at the moment. Decky McAleenan as well doing good stuff. Joe McCulligan obviously is going to be probably be on that card coming up here in in Belfast as well. But um, these lads here, the four lads we saw here, well, three of them anyway, um, are very young in their career. It's basically like their their first or second big opportunity in this sort of level. James Sheehan, a little bit different, and I, I will get to him probably most importantly, in fact, I'm very impressed with James Sheehan. But it was a, a very, very interesting night uh, on Friday night here at Cage Warriors 135 for the next emerging level of Irish MMA that's not, you know, the SBG people who we, you know, mostly see in Bellator right now. So we had uh, James Sheehan, uh, who is um, now six fights into his career out of uh, Team Rhino, which is the gym where Paul Redmond, Neil Seary came from. We'll see Dean Barry fighting in a while. I'll see his first fight under that gym. But, so, um, yeah, you know, we have Kellen Nochran, who's fighting over in Liverpool, but is is from the, the uh, from Ulster. And we have Ryan uh, and Adam Shelley, the Taekwondo brothers, fighting out of Team KF under Chris Fields, uh, Tom King, and... Um, a few others as well, like Carl Pindred is uh, is one of the main guys in that gym as well, which everyone would would probably know. And it was four very different and very very good performances from them. Um, the two Shelley brothers, uh, if you don't know them, as I mentioned, they're like Taekwondo stylists. They they were very very good international competitors in Taekwondo and all. So people know what they're going to be like, um, and they know what they're going to want to do. They're going to want to strike with them. But the Shelley brothers, under Chris Fields and Tom King and the others, have learned a very interesting game and a very very world-wise smart game every time they were pushed against the fence which you know that sort of opponent look at the lads behind me them lads get pushed against the fence in every fight they have they they had a way you know they were landing elbows i remember at one at one stage i think it was the ryan shelley fight where he like got the overhooks on both sides gone on top of the guy and almost mounted him at one stage to to make the negative positions the perceived negative positions into a positive position for you 
because you know that the opponent is going to look for that position is a really, really smart thing to do. And credit to Chris Fields, Tom King, Carl Binder, uh, and everyone else, Ashley Daly and the others at Dash Gym as well for, um, for putting those game plans together and credit to, to Ryan and Adam Shelley I don't like locking them together because they're brothers and all and we probably shouldn't do that but you know I, I, I will do it for, for this case because they both did it in a very similar way and were both in relatively similar fights um, Adam Shelley ended up getting the, the TKO late in the second round uh, Ryan Shelley uh, midway through the third round um, so very impressive stuff and I think that sort of game plan w- and that sort of ability will lead to l- you know, five, six fights down your career, people recognizing you have ability in that area and then maybe trying to stand with you. And that's going to be tough because they're so good standing. So very, very impressed with them. My kind of fighters, as you can see by the wall behind me. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing where they go next. Let me talk about Kayla Nochran a little bit because Kayla Nochran is a guy, you know, who is obviously, as I mentioned, he's fighting out of Darren Till's gym, Team Cowboy, over in Liverpool. So a little bit, you know, detached from Irish MMA a little bit, even though he, you know, he comes from uh, the island of Ireland. Um, and he has been fighting on, uh, on the, the local scene in the UK, not against the best quality opponents in the world, you know, fighting a few cans. But, uh, sorry, as I knock over my thing, I hope my sound is still gone. It is, over. we're good. But now he's fighting. Uh, in Cage Warriors and as I mentioned earlier on I started off the podcast talking about it he won't be getting any easy matchups there he won't be getting any cans there he's fighting a guy here okay who's 1-0 but he's a good very, very good fighter you'll see in his next fight he'd probably be fighting against someone who's you know 3-4-5-0 or you know 10-3 and three or something like that he's calling for the belt already and I'm I, I was really really impressed by Kaelin Lachran's performance he's a very different type of fighter he stands there in the middle of the cage doesn't move his feet much holds his hands up lets you come in and he'll box with you he'll he'll try to go to you he'll try to punch you in the head as hard as he possibly can but he just he isn't just that very good takedowns very strong on top as strong as an ox I mean, I have my notes up here in front of me this guy you know he's one of the strongest guys you'd see uh, in that division anywhere in the world and I was very very impressed with him on top but I love that striking game like that striking game I don't know how long he can keep striking like that to be honest because we, we know MMA these days it's all about variety it's all about movement it's all about uh, you know quickness and, and coming in and out especially at the lower weight classes but he's not about that at the moment anyway <laughs> and uh, I like it honestly I like that style I'd be interested to see if he can keep that style uh, far into his career but his wrestling is very very good as well and uh, maybe he uses that as a bit of a trap to, to catch you in the wrestling but um yeah, very good performance from uh, from Kellen Locker. Looking forward to seeing him. Uh, I think he's a long-term deal with Cage Warriors now, so perfect place for him. And in James Sheehan, like if anyone looks at James Sheehan's record, I think he's 4-2 and two now. But that that really, really doesn't show who James Sheehan is. Two of those, the two of those losses were to Matt Bonner, who fought in this card as well. Cage Warriors middleweight champion only till his last fight or a couple of fights ago. And Ian Gary, you know, who we know is fighting this weekend in, uh, in the UFC. Cage Warriors welterweight champion uh, as well. Those are his two losses. This guy has beaten everyone else apart from those. Two, and that was in his first fight and his third fight. So he's, he, don't be put off by that record. His fights aside from that and even in, even in those fights, in the Ian Gary fight, he went to decision with Ian Gary, and you know, it's, Ian Gary's an absolute monster to, to go to decision with Ian Gary, is no mean feat uh, whatsoever, and Ian Gary has given great respect to James Sheehan after that fight as well, and I'm sure he, he still would if he, he was listening to this, um, James Sheehan got a fantastic knockout here, beautiful left hook, right hand uppercut, absolutely destroyed Carl Michelak inside of a round here, I watched a few Michelak's uh, fights in the preparation for this, obviously doing the previews and stuff, and he's a good fighter, I wasn't lying to you when I said he's a good fighter coming in, but James Sheehan made easy work of this, and this guy is tough, you know, some people, I was talking to, to uh, my, my good friend Graham McDonald over on the, the Sphere Man podcast this week, and he was saying, like, some people think of, of uh, James Sheehan as maybe a grinder or something like that but he's a lot more than that look he can grind you out he can take you down if he needs to do it but he can hit you and he is he is good technique and and he can he can box with you as well if he needs to box with you and that's exactly what he did here and he boxed up Michelak and he ended up finishing him so really really good if any watch the betting show as well this week I get my Irish Aka all four of them here one plus five two three so if you're betting on that you made a, a little bit of money and I'm, I'm glad to be able to to do that for you so I'm um, uh, fair play fair play to, to everyone who did that and if you are uh, if you're betting this weekend who are you going to be betting on at UC 273 can the Korean zombie beat the odds and beat Volkanovski or is the Australian winning by TKO a given get your bets on this weekend at betus.com use that code SHERDOG 
and get a 125% bonus. BetUS.com has been taking bets for well over 25 years, and there's a reason it's the number one UFC sports book. With more betting options, live betting at games, BetUS.com is your new home for UFC betting. Start the fight at BetUS.com and use that code SHERDOG, S H E R D O G. All right, everyone, I will leave it there. My name is Sean Sheehan for SHERDOG.com, and I'll see you all next time.